If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of John for a few minutes. The Gospel of John, and uh, particularly the 19th chapter. I want to talk to you this morning around the subject, Mother's Day at Calvary. Mother's Day at Calvary. One of the unique things about studying the scriptures is being able to see how the divinity, the deity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus surfaces uh, from time to time. And while he's hanging on the cross, you get to see both. You get to see his deity as he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You see his deity when he says, today, Mr. Thief, today, you'll be with me in paradise. You see, only God can forgive people their sins. Only God can take people to heaven. And so you see him in his deity. And then that instance when he is there with his mother, he turns to his mother and he says to her, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. We then see a good picture of his humanity as it comes bounding to the forefront. I want to see four things today in the passage. I want us to see, first of all, Mary's despair. Then I want us to look at a son's duty, John's dependability, and then Jesus' declaration. Verse number 25, if you will, the Bible says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. Watch this. And from that hour, the disciple took her unto his own home. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you for who you are, for what you have done, for what you are doing, and what you're about to do. I pray, God, that you would take your word today and help us see a reflection of you so that we could be more conformed to you than we've ever been before. May the power of your Holy Spirit that's been obvious and evident all day today once again have preeminence here in this place. Uh, Lord, I just thank you for our mothers and the gift that they are to our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want you to think with me just a minute. Do you, you get the idea now that Mary is standing there by the scene of the crucifixion of her son. I can only imagine what must have been going through her heart. I want to reconstruct a little bit, if I could, for just a minute, uh, a little scene from Luke chapter 1 when the Bible says that the angel of the Lord came and encountered Mary and said to her, Mary, you're going to conceive a child by the Holy Ghost. And you're going to bear the child, the son of the most high God. And he is going to rule on the throne of his father, David. And the Bible says that she pondered all of that in her heart. She couldn't get over what she had uh, just heard. And yet now, here she is at the foot of the cross and she's observing everything that is going on around her and somehow or other, she's not able to reconcile what the angel told her with what she is seeing. Wait a minute, you told me he was gonna be a king, but now he's dying as a criminal. You told me he would reign on the throne of David forever and ever and yet, here he is hanging on a cross. He's not on a throne. He's not ruling and reigning. 
he is dying. Well, the Bible says that she'd been dealing with that thing all the way through his adolescence and she was looking forward to the fulfillment of all that she had heard from the angel that day and now he's not dying even a hero's death he's dying a criminal's death and she's watching as his lacerated body with holes in his skin with blood pouring out of his pores and she's unable she is helpless to do anything about it and yet she's still trying to reconcile all of those things that she had heard and believed and had looked forward to. Now she's unable to wipe the sweat off of his brow. She's unable to wipe the blood that is streaming down his face and into his eyes. She's unable to even take a damp cloth and apply it to his parched and swollen lips as she heard him say, I thirst, and she watched as they plunged some vinegar into his mouth. She's unable to do anything about it. Unable to pamper. She sees her own son hanging there with nails in his hand and with nails in his feet with open lacerations all over his body. I can't imagine how Mary must have felt in the midst of her despair. You remember when Jesus was just a few days old? Joseph and Mary carried him to the temple and as they walked into the temple that day, there was an old priest there by the name of Simeon. And the first thing that Simeon said when he saw this little child, he said, huh, ah, uh, there I have seen the salvation of the Lord. Now I can finally depart in peace. And then right on the heels of that declaration, he made a prophecy. And this is what he said. Behold, this child is led to the fall and rising again of many in Israel. For a sign which shall be spoken against, a sword will pass also through thy so I imagine that Mary it was the fulfillment of that prophetic statement by Simeon because she's feeling now that a, that, that a sword has pierced her own soul there at the cross. Mary's despair. One of the oldest books I have in my library is an old, old copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs, and inside uh, that book there is the, uh, the wonderful story or the tragic story of a girl by the name of Perpetua. She was 27 years of age. She was a widow trying to raise a child, but she now has been locked up in prison for her faith, and her daddy comes by one day uh, with the child, and he says to his daughter, honey, if you, you would just sacrifice to the gods, if you would just pay homage to the gods, you, you could go free. And she refused to do it. And he was begging her and begging her to recant her faith, and she would not do it. In a few minutes, the soldiers came, and they snatched her baby out of her arms through the bars of that prison and ushered her daddy out, and she would never see them again. A short time after that, they took her out of that cell and threw her to the wild beasts that tore her heart out of her body. But I suspect her heart was torn away from her a long time before they ever threw her to the wild beasts. You say, what do you mean? Well, I've been pastoring now for nearly 45 years. I've had the unfortunate assignment of having to look into a mother's eyes more times than I ever would like. And I have seen the pain and the hurt and the suffering of a mother as she would lay her child into the ground. I don't know that there's a greater anguish. I don't know that there's a greater pain this side of heaven than for a mother to lose 
her child. Some of you have experienced that sorrow. You've experienced that pain as a mother. So you get a little bit of an idea of how Mary must have felt when she was watching Jesus and she could do nothing about it. The second thing I want you to see is a man's duty. Now you have to understand that Jesus was the oldest son in the family. He was the oldest child in the family. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. So he was the oldest. Somewhere along the way, Joseph had died. And the duty of taking care of the family fell in those days in their tradition on the oldest in the family. So Jesus had some brothers. He had some sisters along the way. He had a mom that he was charged to take care of. The scripture says that the oldest is to take care of that family. I suspect Jesus was a wonderful provider. As we said, his daddy had died. Uh, there is some good strong evidence in scripture that Jesus had been working in that carpenter shop in Nazareth to make sure his family had their needs uh, that were met. So he had a tremendous duty. I I'm watching now as Jesus is on the cross. I understand why he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, because it fit into the fact that he came to seek and to save that which was lost, to forgive people of their sins. I understand the second saying on the cross when he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Again, it was in fulfillment of his assignment, his heavenly assignment, to make sure he got people out of this old world into glory. But when we come to the third, we get a little bit of a different movement in the life of the Lord. He kind of suspends that transactional time with God to deal with a human assignment that was given to him, and that was to take care of his mother. Man has a tremendous duty in taking care of our parents. So Jesus emphasized that by using his cross as a pulpit to preach that fifth commandment in the Word of God. The first four commandments have to do with our relationship with God. The last six commandments has to do with our relationship with our fellow man. The fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother. By the way, that doesn't mean if they are honorable. It doesn't mean that you honor them as long as you live under their house. It, 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 it's ongoing. So here he is preaching that sermon. Our first duty is to God. Our second is to man according to the scriptures, according to this sermon. Can I tell you that the Lord Jesus is preaching this fifth commandment that says honor your father and your mother. By the way, that honoring father and mother comes long before thou shalt not steal. It comes before thou shalt not commit adultery. It comes before thou shalt not covet. It comes before bearing false witness. And Jesus is preaching. It's a sad day when children fail to see and realize the duty God has laid on us to care for our parents. Hey, is your, is your mom still living? It's not the government's job to take care of your mom. It's our job. It's not the welfare of the state. It's our duty. It's our responsibility. First Timothy 5 says, Honor widows that are widows indeed, but if any widow have children or nephews, goes all the way to the nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to require for the parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. And if any provide not for his own, he's worse than an infidel, according to the scriptures. Jesus preached a sermon in Mark chapter 7. 
The children said, we, 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 we don't have enough money to take care of our parents. We gave all of our money, our extra money. We, we gave it all to church and we don't have enough to take care of them. And Jesus did not receive that as an excuse. Let, let me just tell you, you can spend all your money on the cars and the toys and the boats and the vacations and all of that stuff and you don't have enough money to deal with your parents. God says that's not an excuse. I think it's our duty to take care of our parents. I'll just say this before I go on. I used to say that being a daddy was the toughest assignment that God ever gave me. But I have discovered in these last few years, last three or four years, that being a parent to the parent is by far the most difficult assignment that God has ever, ever laid on my life. Let me give you the third is John's dependability. Powerful word. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And now he looks across the crowd and he sees John, the only disciple, the one that he loved. And then he sees his mother and he says to her, woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. He, he, he was finishing the transaction between he and his heavenly father for uh, dealing with the sins of mankind. But he had to stop for a minute and deal with some unfinished business that lay before him, and that was the care and the consideration for his mother. And so he says to John, John, it ought to be you up here on this cross instead of me. It ought to be all of these people on the cross instead of me. Uh, John, this ought to be you up here with nails in your hands and your feet, but I am your substitute. I came to take your spot. I came to die your death. I came to be your sin. But now then, John, you need to be the substitute for the substitute. I can't stay here anymore. And yet my mama needs to be taken care of. So I want you to be my substitute. I've had the responsibility for all of these years. And now I want you to be the substitute for the substitute. Now the Bible says, from that hour, from that hour, doesn't take much too creativity, doesn't take too much stretching, doesn't take too much imagination. Bible scholars tell us that from that very hour, in other words, he heard what Jesus said, and he goes over to Mary and puts his arm around Mary, and he says to her, I'm going to take care of you. And the scholars tell us that in all probability, at that very moment, with his arm around Mary, he takes her away from that scene. Mary, you don't need to see Jesus go through all of this stuff. You don't need to observe all of this. It's too painful. It's too much anguish for anybody to have to bear. And those same scholars say that he took her to his house and for the next 11 years, he cared for her as his own mother. Long before he ever became a preaching evangelist, long before he ever became a pastor of a church, he took care of Mary. He followed what God had asked him to do. Now, what's the point of all of this? Well, I can give you one for sure. Jesus had a lot of assignments. One of those assignments was to preach the gospel to all of the world. And as he's ascending back to the heavenly father, he says to you and to me, 
He says, you shall be witnesses unto me. I can't be but in one place at one time. I've got to go to the heavenly Father. But while I am gone, I want you to be my substitute. I want you to carry out the gospel. I want you to take it to the ends of the world. I want you to go across the planet. And I want you to tell every man, woman, boy, and girl the gospel, the good news. Be my substitute. Christ has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in the way. He has no tongue but our tongue to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to bring them to his side. You know, one of the things that we can speculate about here is uh, why did he choose John? Why John? Well, here's a big deal. John had the means to be able to take care of her. He was born from a wealthy family. He was the son of Zebedee. Zebedee had a big fishing operation. He employed lots of people there. And, and he came from that. Now, John may not have been rich. John may not have been wealthy. But John had the financial means to take care of Jesus' mother. Let, let me help you with something. Come here, man. Let me, let me, let me help you with something. You ready for this? God will never ask you to do something that you're incapable of doing. God will always meet the need of your life to accomplish what he gives you to do. He will always provide for you. He never expects from us that which we are incapable of doing. Take care of my mama. Now, let me give you number four is the Lord's declaration. He says to Mary, woman, what a term, what a term. Let me quickly say to you that Jesus was not dishonoring his mother. He was not at all doing anything that would bring shame or dishonor to his family. Um, he was not being disrespectful. But what was going on here was something so beautiful that it's actually mind-boggling. He was transitioning his mother to showing her that there is something even more beautiful than this earthly relationship that we have enjoyed for these 33 years. And that is that we can enjoy a spiritual relationship. By the way, he was also saying, Mary, I just want you to know, or Mama, I want you to know, uh, you're, you don't have a sense of entitlement because you are my earthly mother. Uh, you're not going to get any special privileges because you are my mother. Matter of fact, this old boy over here on the cross that I'm going to carry to glory with me, he has just as much rights and glory as you're going to have. Mm. What, what, what's this... What was this all about? In breaking up this earthly relationship, he was providing a much more meaningful relationship. As a matter of fact, if you study the book of Acts, you're going to discover in that word that Mary was numbered among the believers. Now, James was the half-brother of Jesus. But when you go study the book of James and you get into that first chapter and the way that James opens the book up, he doesn't open it up by saying, I, James, the half-brother of Jesus. What did he say? He says, James, the servant of the Lord. A much more powerful relationship. Much more meaningful relationship. My sister is present with us in this service this morning. She and my brother-in-law. In the mid-1970s, I was asked to preach a sermon at my little home church. My knees were knocking, sweat was pouring, stuttered profusely, somehow made it through the sermon gave the invitation and the altar kind of flooded with people. 
I went down and knelt with them and was praying with them. And I'll never forget, as long as I live, I felt an arm across my back and my shoulder, and I turned. There was my sister. I love my sister. She's one of the most talented and gifted people with her hands that you've ever come across in your life. I, I loved how she took care of me as a little boy and cooked meals for me and ironed my clothes for me just as a little boy. I love my earthly sister. But I want to tell you, I wouldn't take anything for that day when she put her arms around me at that altar and my sisters walked with God ever since. I have a oneness in the Spirit of God with her that supersedes any earthly tie that we've ever had. My brother, as you know, serves here. Sometime in the late 1980s, I got a call from him, and he says, I'm coming in from East Tennessee, and I was just wondering if you would meet me over here uh, at a restaurant on I-85. I said, I'll be glad to, and we set a time and a place, and I met him over there, and he comes in, and he sits down in that booth in that restaurant with me, and he says to me, I'll never forget the words, little brother, you're never going to have to worry about me ever again. I've turned my life over to Jesus, and I intend to walk with him until I die, and I've watched that consistent, faithful walk with God, and we have a oneness in Christ that supersedes all of the physical attributes of his earthly relationship with me. I, I, I want to tell you, Mary, I want to tell you, Mama, Thank you for everything that you've done in these 33 years, but there's something a whole lot more important than our earthly time. It's amazing. I can't help but remember Mary's words from Luke 1. My soul, now she, she's talking about a little baby here. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Wow! A spiritual relationship. I'm here to tell you on this Mother's Day 2019, from the scene of Calvary, you can have that kind of relationship. You can have it. It can be yours today. How many of you only have earthly relationship with your family? Well, I want to tell you, it may be loving, it may be good, it may be kind, it may be anything and everything this world could ever hope for. But I'm going to tell you this, until you get to Jesus and know him as your Lord and Savior, you don't know what it's like to have family. There's nothing like being in the family of God. There's nothing like having your family around you that you know, okay, we may get separated down here in this life, but we're going to spend eternity in glory together because we're not only, we're not only kin down here. We're brothers and sisters in Christ and nothing is ever going to take that away. Husbands, do you have that kind of relationship to your wife? Wives, do you have that kind of relationship with your husbands? Do you have that kind of relationship with your children? Yesterday, that 22-year-old, when we were memorializing him, his mother came and she stood right here as strong and filled with the Spirit and she says, I'll see you again. Do you have that? Do you have that? Oh, if you don't, you need it. Would you bow with me and let's pray together? Is your family circle complete? Is your family one in the Lord? Do you have the assurance that you're going to spend eternity with your family in glory? 
because you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or if you don't, you need to know him. You say, preacher, I sure would like to know him. I, I just don't know how. Right where you're seated, if you're willing today to turn away from a life of sin, and if you're willing today to place your faith and your trust in Jesus, I want you to pray something like this with me right where you're seated right now. Pray something like this. Heavenly Father, you can pray it out loud or you can pray it in the confines of your own heart. It makes no difference. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead on the third day. Father, I am a sinner. My sin has separated me from God. Please forgive me of all my sin. I willingly now turn away from sin and with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.